Welcome to the Piano Men with Stanley Carr. Hi, I'm Stanley Carr, and we have a special guest on the program this evening. If you recognize the song we played at the top of the hour, then you might know who my special guest is tonight. I am very pleased to welcome Emmy-winning host and Grammy-nominated pianist John Tesh to the show. For the past 45 years, John has been internationally recognized as a journalist, composer, broadcaster, and concert pianist. His Intelligence for Your Life radio show currently airs on 350 stations and reaches 14 million people each week. John's highly successful and varied career path also includes six years as a correspondent for CBS News, a 10-year run as anchor on Entertainment Tonight, broadcast host and music composer for the Barcelona and Atlanta Olympic Games, inductions into both the National Radio Hall of Fame and the North Carolina Music Hall of Fame, and the unique distinction of composing what critics have hailed as the greatest sports theme in television history for NBC Sports Basketball. John's live television concerts, including the seminal Live at Red Rocks, have raised millions for public television. John and his wife, Connie Selica, live in Los Angeles, California. In 2015, John overcame a terminal cancer diagnosis by relying on the steadfast determination and grit that have been the hallmarks of his life and career. In his new memoir, Relentless Unleashing a Life of Purpose, Grit, and Faith, John reveals his secret to overcoming the many pivotal challenges he's faced and the hope that readers will find inspiration and guidance that they can apply to overcome their own struggles. Welcome to the show, John. Thank you. It's great to be here. Yeah, let's get into it. So why did you decide to call your new book Relentless? Uh, you know, it's, um, I, I, I got approached by HarperCollins in, in Nashville when I was in the middle of, a, of this cancer battle that was about three years long. And they, they you know, it was, it was a unique way that I got healed. And, and it's, a, it's a longer story, but uh, it's, in, it's, it's titrated throughout the book, but it involved uh, some serious surgeries and chemo and, uh, and you know, bone, bone biopsies and all kinds of crazy stuff that, that was a little bit more suffering than I had in mind. Um, but they said, wow, it, this would be a great, your, your, your victory over, over a terminal uh, diagnosis is something that we'd like for you to write about. Do you have any other stories <laughs> about your life. And I said, yeah. well, I was homeless when I was 19 and a half years old. And uh, I was the youngest correspondent. 36 months later, I was the youngest correspondent at CBS News in New York. And they were like, that's interesting. And then I told the story about, uh, about Live at Red Rocks and, and a bunch of other stuff. And they said, yeah, but start writing. And we have a ghostwriter for you. And, and you can just, uh, he'll interview you and then he'll write the book and we'll get it done in six months. And about a month in, I, I realized that you know, the guy was nice, but I just realized that I needed to do it myself. You know, mm -hmm. and, and um, so I, I, I set about reading like, you know, every memoir I could think of. I, I, I mean, I'm, a, I'm an okay writer, but I'd never written 80,000 words. Yeah. And, so, uh, and so I started and I missed four deadlines and it took two and a half years. And so the, the title just sort of describes the writing of the book. Not really. Um, <laughs> it's, it, it's, the title is really just advice. You know, yeah. it, it is advice for, uh, for taking adversity and turning it into victories. Such a powerful message of grit, determination, hard work. You've certainly acquired all of those skills. Tell me, we're going to talk a little bit about some of your early mentors, some of the people that you worked with in the early beginnings of your life. Who are some of the people that you consider to be some of the mentors from the early part of your life? They could be teachers, parents, anyone. Yeah, I mean, uh, chief among them was in so many different areas. It, he was a he was a band teacher, but uh, his name was Dr. Thomas Wagner, and at a tiny school on Long Island called Stewart Avenue School, uh, elementary school that started in second grade and, and went through sixth, which was odd. You know, it was like what? Well, yeah, well, first grade. You know, uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, kindergarten was 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 kindergarten and first grade at that school. <laughs> but, uh, but this guy was nuts. I mean, he was like, he was sort of like Mr. Holland's opus and whip song. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Whiplash, Here's that guy. Yeah. yeah. And, and uh, he was just into, he was just no stopping this guy. And, and you're talking about his tiny school, unrecognized school nationally, certainly. And he ended up being New York State Teacher of the Year two years, you know, and so, mm -hmm. so obviously there was something there and, and we didn't know what we had. We're just, we're seven, seven year olds, you know, mm -hmm. but you get, you get there and, and on the first day of school, 
they say, okay, uh, write down if, whether you want to be in the choir, the band, or the theater. And I'm like, what? And you put them down in order, you know, one, two, mm. three. And, and so I wrote down uh, theater, theater, theater. And within about a half hour, I had a trumpet in my hand. And, oh, man. Uh, they just started handing out instruments and said, here we go. And you sit down and they're like, okay, okay, everybody hit, a, hit an A, you know, and you're like, what? You know, and so that, that was really, that's sort of a, you know, the, uh, it was his metaphor for life, which was persistence, grit, huge amounts of, uh, of, of risk, and also process. And so the, yeah. the whole, the, the whole, my whole book is really about how important process is. I've studied it my whole life. I've studied great people. I've read hundreds of books about it. I've always, I've always been fascinated with, with, uh, with decoding greatness. And so, uh, there are people that are my mentors that, that they don't even know. You know, you can do that, right? Obviously. Yeah, absolutely. I, mean, I mean, Rick Wakeman, for example, from yes. Yes, was my, was my mentor for years. And I, I didn't even meet him until two years ago, you know, wow. and, and I'm talking to, I spent a half hour with him. He's like, John, I had no idea, you know, I kind of, of course you didn't, you know, but uh, it's, yeah, there, there are many of them, but I would say the, the biggest, the, the, the biggest influence in my life was really Dr. Thomas Wagner. So you put down theater when you wanted to write down your list of choices. Did you want to pursue acting? I, I didn't think about it. Well, when I was a kid, I was, uh, you know, I was the youngest in my family by 11 years. And mm -hmm. so when I came along, my parents were like, you know, whatever, just live in the basement. You know, <laughs> it was 1952 when I was born. Yeah. You know, and so uh, down there was, uh, you know, all kinds of like, you know, tape recorders and film and stuff like yeah. that. And, and uh, I, I, I had been to the theater in New York, this courtesy of my parents a couple of times. And I just thought it sounded interesting. Yeah. But band, marching band and orchestra did not sound that, that interesting to me. Plus, I, I was studying piano since I was six, mm -hmm. which was a year before I got the band. Um, and, and they didn't want a pianist in the, in, in the, so I, I just figured there wasn't any place for me. And I certainly wasn't interested in trumpets. Well, you certainly have found your passions and skills for music. How did you find that passion for music at such a young age? Sitting, sitting in a group, you know, I didn't have a passion for piano at all. My, my mom was a taskmaster. And I actually tell this story on stage using the original um, egg timer that my, my minute monitor, egg timer that mom would put on the, on the piano and she would set that to an hour and then another hour and I'd play my hand in exercises. And there were some, some really good teachers on Long Island that, that actually worked at the Juilliard School, and 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 one of them was a was a part time teacher in the, uh, in the in the piano program, Mrs. Andriani, and she became my piano teacher, and so I had some really serious um, sight reading instruction, you know, in hand positions and, and and stuff like that. But I hated it; I couldn't go outside and play until I. My mom was a was a retired surgical nurse, so she was a very very disciplined person, and I was not. I was I had ADD pretty badly, um, and so she decided that I was going to play piano for two hours a day before I went outside. And uh, I became really good, but I hated it, you know, and, and also I also had really bad stage fright. They would stick me in these recitals and finally they just gave up because I would freeze up in the, hmm. in the, yeah, in the middle of them. Um, but uh, my real love for music was the, uh, I wasn't a real popular kid. I was incredibly skinny and just shy. Hmm. And uh, when they stuck me in the, in the orchestra and, and jazz band and band and all the rest of that stuff, the collaboration thing for me was, was, was really great. All, all of a sudden I had, uh, it was very clicky, right? In the fifties and sixties. Yeah. But, uh, but when, I, when I ended up being what they used to call a band geek, at least that was an identity for me. And you started taking lessons, okay? So you started taking lessons at six. What made you want to stick with piano over the trumpet? Piano is a very beautiful instrument, very easy to learn. A lot of people call it one of the most easiest instruments you can learn. Why did you decide to, decide to take piano versus taking the trumpet, pursuing the trumpet? Well, I was actually a, a much better trumpet player than I was a pianist uh, because I had, I had Dr. Dr. Wagner, I had all that experience um, playing in, in, in an orchestra, a marching band, and a, and a dance band. And I, so I played, I played um, not only did I play trumpet, but I also played uh, trombone and baritone horn. Um, I just, I was told I had very good vibrato, so I don't, I don't know. But uh, when I got to high school, I continued in the, in the band, and I ended up being named for uh, two years at, into New York State Symphonic Orchestra, where they take two kids from every school in, uh, in the state, basically, and they formed this giant orchestra, and Vaclav Nelly Bell was the, uh, was the yeah, I know, was the, was the conductor. So I, I had more experience 
playing trumpet. Um, and I certainly had more ad lib experience playing trumpet. And, and once I discovered that, that as a keyboard player, when the Dave Clark Five came and the Doors came along, once I discovered that you could actually have an organ in a band, because before that I had never really seen one, mm -hmm. uh, certainly not on the Ed Sullivan show, um, then, then I, I realized that, uh, that I was just going to play three chords at a time, and I, I really didn't study as much as I was as I was studying, uh, you know, trumpet. So back then, the organ was like the main keyboard related instrument at the time with all the groups of the 60s and the yeah. late 50s yeah the problem was the the only organ that sounded any good was a hammond b3 mm -hmm. you know a, a sawed off b3 which everybody knows that you know that sound whether it's from uh from uh uh booker t or or um or even sly and the family stone or stevie winwood you know any of that stuff mm -hmm. um or lee michaels or or, or uh yeah, I guess there's more rattling around in my head, but, but it's so expensive. Right. And I used to cut yards mm -hmm. to try and make money to buy instruments. And so I ended up with a, 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 a people, this is, this is definitely retro, a Farfisa combo compact deluxe with a used Leslie, which of mm. course, as you know, is that is the spinning speaker, you know, Yes. and it makes that, that wonderful sound. Um, and so, I mean, I mean, that, 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 that particular instrument with the Leslie, you could, you could literally just, um, uh, you could just hold one note, right? And, and it would sound like a, like a solo. You know, I was going through your book and you've had quite the career as a sportsman. You were playing soccer in college at North Carolina State. Tell me about how you were able to find grit and determination during your time there. Yeah, I mean, and I still listen to, there are, <clears throat> there's some great YouTube videos. Uh, I was listening to one, you know, while I was washing dishes just about an hour ago. Uh, there are great uh, YouTube mashup videos where, where it's, uh, you know, it'll, it'll, it may be uh, Jocko Willink, the great uh, uh, ex-Navy SEAL or, or, or Will Smith or Denzel Washington or sure. any of those guys. I mean, mashups of guys that talk about, uh, you, know, uh, you know, Les Brown, even, even, even a little Tony Robbins, although I'm not a huge fan. Um, but uh, talk about process. You know, and talk about persistence and grit, and and you know, Will Smith, as famous as he is, admits yeah. that he he doesn't feel like he has any any uh, God given talent. He just his whole thing is I you will not outwork me, and so I, it really describes me. I mean, I was I was in the middle of my class SATs and and grades at uh, at Garden City, and I was a you know, I was a second string everything in in sports. I mean, I lettered, but so I was right in the middle of everything. And and my o my only way to sort of get out of obscurity, even with, even with piano and trumpet, was just to practice until you couldn't stand it anymore. And, and I just oh, didn't. Sure. I just didn't have. Um, I, I never got, I didn't have that, that, that brain thing that says I'm exhausted by this. I just, and even to this day, I mean, um, I, I, the way I live my life right now is I live my life in 12 minutes. I know you're going to think I'm hmm. nuts, but I have a timer, <laughs> a boxing timer on my phone and I start at four 30 in the morning mm -hmm. and at 12, for, for 12 minutes, I work out and then, and then I take a 30 second rest and then for 12 minutes I work on the radio show and I go back and forth yeah. and back and forth. And I do that for about seven hours a day I mean, wow. rel relentlessly, you know, and I mean, something will come up, right? When no pun family, intended. If you're, if, if you're, yeah, I know if you're working, working from home, you know, things, you know, things will come up and you pause it and you, and you keep going. But uh, I, I don't have the, I don't have the gift of, of natural talent. And so for me, the muscle of persistence and, and grit uh, although it was it was it was tempered by by the cancer battle for for three years, but it was still it was still in there. It's just I, it just I had to rest a little bit more than I normally do. No doubt. If you'll forgive the expression, the rags to riches story, John, can you elaborate how you were able to get hired to work as a film editor for a local television station in Raleigh, North Carolina? Because that is a fantastic job. Just to really nice gig to have to get started. I know for me, I was starting out learning video editing when I interned at a local station here in Nashville. Tell me about your time at the local television station in Raleigh. Yeah, I mean, I was, uh, I, I worked, uh, I mean, I was in textile chemistry for about uh, uh, five or six semesters uh, at my dad's uh, urging insistence. Mm -hmm. and, and I took a radio and television course 
that I, I used to, a friend of mine said, it's an easy A. I had no interest really in radio television career. Yeah. I didn't know what I wanted to do other than play piano and uh, hang out. Um, and this was in 1972, 73. And so uh, I took the course, I got bit by the bug instantly and I just stopped going to the, my other classes. And, I, and all I, I just, I stayed in that radio lab and, and the and professor's like, you know, you're gonna get thrown out of school. <laughs> and, uh, and, but I just kept at it. And then and I, I ended up with a, you know, my, my grade point average just kept plummeting to like about a one six. Hmm. So I was in danger of being thrown off the sports teams anyway. And I decided I needed to drop all those courses and I was, and, and just switch over to communications. And I, uh, I went around to my professors and all but one said, yeah, okay, we don't want you in this class anyway, you stink. <laughs> you know, so they, they uh, let me, they signed the drop ad card, but one of my professors, the statistics professor said, no, you, it, we're past the drop ad date. I have to follow university policy and I'm not going to sign this thing. And so uh, I pleaded with him and, you know, telling him that I had to wait, I would have to wait a year to change my major. And he said, no, he wouldn't sign it. So on advice from a fraternity brother, I, I actually forged his signature on the uh, drop. Oof. There were hundred, I know there were 120 kids, kids in that, that lecture hall statistics. I figured he wouldn't, you know, and that's what my friend told me that I drop courses all the time, just sign in his name. Well, he checked, reported me, the chancellor of the university called uh, sent a letter to my father a registered letter to my dad uh, saying that i had broken the honor code at nc state and that i was being suspended indefinitely as begin being given an f for the course and that uh uh i i had to leave you know and so my dad then who was who told me i, I brought shame to the family he threw me out of the house and then my girlfriend broke up with me and so here I was, I didn't have a place to live. I didn't have mm. any friends. All my friends were going to school. Yeah. And uh, so I ended up in a tent in a park in Raleigh for about six months, breaking concrete on a construction crew and also uh, pumping gas. And I, I, I talked my way into a, a radio station after doing a sort of a fake demo. Uh, and they gave me a job Sunday mornings, re, uh, playing the, the religious tapes from 4 a.m. to 7. And you know how it, it happens, you know, somebody leaves and they move on and they, and they don't have anybody else to play yeah, the job. for sure. And, me, and meanwhile, gritty me, I was, you know, every night I was uh, reading a newspaper in, in, the, in the mirror in the bathroom and trying to memorize stories and sort, sort of manifest myself as a, as a correspondent. And while I was at radio, I, I wanted to get a job in television because everybody did at that time. And I went and applied and I said, the only position we have is, is news film developer. Do you have hmm. any experience? And I said, well, I was the, I was the editor of the, of my high school yearbook and, the, and photo editor. And they said, okay, that's enough. And they hired me. So I, yeah, so I was the film editor for the, for the TV news at WTVD in, in, in uh, Durham, North Carolina. And what happened was the, an anchor man that was supposed to come in didn't show up. He took another job and just took off, didn't show up. And that was the only guy under 75 years old at the station. So they put me on the air and they, uh, I, I thought I was just going to be on one night and they couldn't find anybody else and they forgot to take me off. So I was on the air for several months there and that's how I got my first TV job. We're going to play Give Me Forever I Do, which is a song that you recorded with uh, James Ingram. Back yeah, the song. Yeah, 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 the song was original, originally written by Carter Cathcart, uh, an old friend of mine. And then uh, I, I, a friend of my, a friend of my Scott Myers, a friend of mine, said, "Hey, you really need a radio hit. You know, you've been playing music for a long time." And and I said, "Well, I, you know, I, I play instrumental music. I'm not going to have a radio hit." And he said, "Why don't you call up somebody and, and have them sing on a on a song?" And and uh, and I said, uh, "Who?" And he goes, "Call up James Ingram." And I said, "I'm not calling James Ingram. He's won like 90 Grammys." <laughs> And he said, well, I found his number here. Call him. So I called him and uh, I said, hey, it's John Tesh. I was on Entertainment Time. He goes, hey, man, how's it going? I said, hey, uh, Mr. Ingram. Mr. Ingram, that's my dad, you know. And, uh, <laughs> and he go, I said, uh, uh, I've had some friends suggest that we might want to, you know, I mean, the guy had just been working with Quincy Jones the following week. Yeah. Who might, might want to, uh, we should write together. And he said, well, yeah, where, where do you live? And so I gave him my address, came over and we sat down at the piano and, and we were, I, he said, what do you want to write? I said, I want to write, write a wedding song. And there's a piece of it here from my friend Carter. And so uh, James and I worked on it and, and, uh, and it ended up being, being a number one hit, uh, Give Me Forever I Do. And, 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 and it gets played at you know, thousands of weddings every, every year. But it was, it was almost like it was that simple. <laughs> you know, it's just, just call James Ingram. Everything will be fine. 
No kidding. All right, we're going to play Give Me Forever I Do. This is John Tesh and James Ingram on The Piano Men. And we're back. You're tuned to The Piano Men with Stanley Carr. I'm chatting tonight with pianist, composer, broadcaster, and author of his new book, Relentless, Unleash Unleashing a Life of Purpose, Grit, and Faith. John Tesh tonight about his illustrious career. John, if you, if you can, can you give us a summary of your early television career? <laughs> Um, yeah, it looks like a, if you know what a swish pan is, it looks like a swish pan where you take a camera and you turn it on and you just sort of swish it around. Oh, sure. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I spent a lot of time in it's what's, what's on for me, Stanley, is that, is that most people think that my career in broadcasting started at entertainment tonight. That was in 1986, but it actually started in 1973 after I was uh, asked to leave uh, school and started in radio. I wasn't there for very long. Um, and when I got on the air in, in, in Durham, North Carolina, as the, uh, as the, uh, the last choice for Anchorman, I just, I, 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 I just started sending tapes out. Right. And I, I found this head, this, this headhunter in New York named Shirley Barish. And this is in the book as well. And Shirley, yeah. uh, it was, had, there was a big piece on her in TV guide about how she was a, she would find, uh, she, she had a real gravelly voice and she goes, I know where all the bodies are buried, honey. You know? <laughs> and, and what happened was right, right about that time was when, was when news was going from, you know, Cronkite and Huntley and Brinkley. And it was yep. going from that to happy talk. And it was more like, you know, the weatherman would talk to the sports guy, sports guy yep. would give the, would needle the anchor guys. And, and uh, there'd be a consumer reporter and everybody would have a, it was eyewitness news and action news. And there was, mm -hmm. there was big new, big bombastic, uh, timpanies and 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 trumpets for the for the news themes and and not just the sound of a teletype and so uh, they were looking for you know they were looking for anchors and, and sure. they were looking for young strapping men and women and so <laughs> when i when i sent the tape out to to shirley and sure enough she just you know she's she's got all these stations calling her saying hey we need a this we need a blonde guy with a deep voice or this and that mm -hmm. so she found a job for me in in orlando Mm -hmm. at, at, uh, w, at Channel 9 WFTV, and this was in 73 and a half. And then uh, I was there for four months, and there was a guy named Irving Waugh who ran and owned a station in, in, right there in Nashville, WSM, which used to, used to yep. be owned by Na National Life, and they actually owned, it, owned and st started and owned the Grand Ole Opry and yep. an Opry Land. And he was in a hotel room having done a, uh, he had had a conference at Disney World, which is also in its nascency at that time. And he saw me on the air and called me up at the station and said, young man, you're coming to work for me. And I thought it was, you know, there did lots of pranks in newsrooms. I thought it was a prank. And, uh, and within an hour, he had sent a, a ticket to Nashville, uh, in, uh, a plane ticket to the station in, in my name. And so I, flew there like the next day I took a couple of days off flew there and I met uh, a guy named Dan Miller the anchorman Pat Sajak was the weatherman Oprah Winfrey was was at the station across the street at 19 years old channel five and it was an amazing news organization it was it was it was something like I'd never seen before and it turns out you know it was they had a like an 80 share or something in the market I mean, yeah. 80 percent of course for people who don't know what that is 80 percent of people who are watching television and I are watching WSM news mm -hmm. but but Dan Miller was so good that uh, there were literally, you know, every network, uh, it, the three networks, there was no Fox back in the day, yeah. but every network was looking to hire him. And so they realized they, they needed some, they needed some bench. And, uh, so they wanted to hire me. And so they did. And I, I, which didn't make any, I didn't make any friends in Orlando. I'd only been there for four months, but there was a guy named Mike Kettenring who had also been hired at the same time. He was award winning, uh, news director of, out of New Orleans. And, and they wanted this, they wanted a real high end news department. And so I was one of the reporters in that newsroom and, and Mike was the one that taught me really how to be a, a correspondent. And uh, that's how I, so I ended up winning a, uh, an Associated Press Award for investigative journalism for helping to change the fire wow. in, in, in Nashville. And, and when that happened, I, I started sending tapes out again and sent one to New York City and I got a I, I got a personal note from the from the news director saying, Hey, why don't you fly to New York? I want to talk to you. Uh, and I was you know, I was twenty three. I got Ooh. there and I walked into the newsroom, you know, because he wanted to walk me around. I walked into the newsroom, and in that newsroom was um, John Stossel, who used to be uh, correspondent on Twenty Twenty, and also uh, 
uh, on Fox and, and Meredith Vieira was in there from, from The View. And uh, after I got there, Brian Williams and, and Bill O'Reilly were in there. So it was, it was just packed with, <clears throat> with talent. Mm-hmm. And it was, but it was also the most competitive environment I've ever been in because you, you didn't really get, you got a little bit of money, you know, from AFTRA, but you didn't really get paid unless you got on the air. So you were, yeah. just, you were, you were just hustling your butt off. And, and so I spent, I spent six years uh, there at the, at the local station. That was the same building that, that Mike Wallace and, and, uh, and Walter Cronkite were in. So it was, it was an amazing time there for a while. No doubt about that. Let's backtrack a little bit here. So you, you were, you were, as you mentioned, you were at WSM for a couple of years. What was it like working with Dan Miller and Pat Sajak there at the time? There's a good description in the book about, about that, about that meeting when I showed up. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's always tough to walk into anybody knows this, who's a, who's an actor. It's very tough to walk into a situation where there's an established cast, so to speak, especially if it's a news team and you walk in there. Uh, and I've done that several times. Um, but, but with these guys, it was, uh, I mean, say Jack was a little like, you know, say Pat is a good friend of mine now, but say Jack was a little like, who's this guy, you know? <laughs> um, but, uh, but Dan was, uh, right away was, uh, just so warm and, and, you know, and, and, you know, most of the time, I'm not sure what your experience is, but most of the time in certainly in television, I don't have as much experience working with other people in radio. I mean, I created this, uh, my family and I created this radio program ourselves and and that's what we do. But, but in in the television world and certainly back then in the, in the seventies and early eighties, incredibly uh, uh, competitive. I mean, and I, it made me really competitive. I was not a nice person. I, all I could think of was just winning, you mm-hmm. know, and, and uh, I mean, I had a couple of people describe me as, you know, a guided missile, you know, and, and I was, all, I, I didn't see my, much of my family. Uh, I tried to get married. That didn't work. I really didn't have any girlfriends because there was just, I was working 15 hour days and I was living a really fast paced life where we'd work you know, 12, 13 hour days, then go out Mm -hmm. to studio 54 for three hours and then wake up after three hours sleep, you know, and, and, um, and that was, uh, that was an an, an incredible time. I mean, it was, but it was just, it was so, uh, I I think about it now, I think about if if somebody tried to hire me in New York said, Hey, we'd like you to come back and do the news in New York city. I I just wouldn't have the energy. I mean, it was, it's, it's an enormous amount of energy it took back in the day to actually cover news there. Well, you definitely went through some obstacles to get to where you were when you got your big break at WCBS in New York. Can you tell me the feeling of getting that call to go to New York City? Yeah, it was sort of matter of fact from, from Ed Joyce, who was the news director. And he, he never he didn't really offer me a job. He said, hey, I got your tape. And um, why don't you come? Well, I'm, uh, you, you fly in uh, on Wednesday. I'm going to have you back on Friday. But uh, I just want to have a conversation with you and just, uh, and, and see where you're headed, you know, which, what, and I saw so it wasn't, it was almost like I had no idea what he had in mind. You know, did he, did he want me to come and, and be a, an editor? Cause I could also edit. You know, I, did he want me just to come and hang out? I, I didn't know. It wasn't like, Hey, we like your, we like your style. We'd like to hire you as a correspondent. But he was so afraid that I, I would embarrass when, when we got there, he said, we're looking as soon as I got there, it was like, he said, you know, took me out to lunch with the, with the general manager and, and Neil Darrow. And he said, we're looking at you to be first a, a reporter. And then, and then maybe you can anchor the news on the, on the weekends. And, hmm. and of course I was a, I was an idiot. I said, well, you know, I'm used to anchoring the news every night. So I'm not sure if that's something I want to do. And, and, and he was like, he goes, he goes, uh, this is the number one newscast in the number one city in America. It's the flagship station of CBS News. Um, you sure you want to be saying this? You know, that kind of thing. I was like, oh, well, sorry. I didn't mean to offend you. I just wanted to tell you what I'm, you know, what I'm, what I'm used to, you know. And uh, he said, okay. So we started over and we had a conversation about, about their, their newscast. Of course, before I got there, I had, sent, had somebody because you know, my whole family was in New York, uh, somebody sent me like you know VHS tapes of the newscast so I could actually watch it. And but it turned out that one of the anchormen there in New York City was a guy. Uh, Jim Jensen was his name, and he was a guy that that I used to watch when I was a kid. His name was Jim Jensen. So this was the news team that I had watched when I was a, when, when I was growing up. And here I was, 
five years after graduating from, you know, from high school and leaving New York, watching him, here I was being offered a job to work with that same team. I mean, it was, for me, it was an insanity. But one of the things that Joyce said was, you know, we, we, we are really concerned about, uh, you know, about your experience. We think your technique is amazing, but, but I don't think he used the word amazing. But <laughs> he said, we, uh, we want to make sure you're reading five newspapers a day and you're staying up and, you, you know, and you deal with the legal department and all that stuff. So they, um, they trained me and they groomed me pretty good. Well, one of the fine experiences that you were able to uh, have was the ability to combine your love for broadcasting with your passion for music when you went to CBS Sports to work for the CBS Sports Spectacular television program. What was the experience like there for you? Well, first of all, I was shocked that somebody from CBS Sports called me up. Uh, I mean, it was all in the family. I was working for CBS News, but Terry O'Neill... Uh, and I think this is a good story in the book too. Terry O'Neill uh, called me up and said, Hey, we'd like to talk to you about coming over and working for us on the sports side. And, and I said to Terry, I said, you know, Terry, um, I can't name three NBA teams. I think you got the wrong guy. There's probably some other people here, the, the sportscasters that, that would be better at it. He goes, no, no, we've seen your, your, your live work and you're good on your feet. And the, I, this, the ideas we have for you are not really covering baseball or football or basketball, but, but we're talking about uh, uh, anthology sports. I said, what the heck is that? He said, well, you know, downhill skiing and figure skating, and you would travel all over the world covering these sports. And most people don't know what the rules are anyway, so they'd be learning right along with you. But we're looking for something very dramatic, and we know that you're a, you're a composer, and so you, you, know, you might be able to, uh, you know, to work in some of your music. And, and I was just, it's, I was scared to death. Yeah. But, um, but I went to Ed Joyce, the news director, and I said, do you know anything about this? He goes, I know everything about it. And he said, I think it would be a great, a great opportunity for you. You know, the difference between working at a local station and a network station, of course, is, is you know, network uh, is all over, the, all over the world, basically. Right. So I took the job, and, uh, and yeah, I ended up leave, uh, living in, in Europe for on and off for about six or seven years, covering wild events. And, and then also, I would always either rent or... or or bring synthesizers and, 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 you know, early, early computers like Mac SEs and stuff with me and did a lot of, um, did a lot of music compos uh, compositions for, for things like the Tour de France and, and downhill skiing, a lot of themes. And that's where, that's ultimately where the uh, NBA basketball thing came from. And of course, you might be best known, perhaps, as the co-anchor of Entertainment Tonight, where your run lasted from 1986 to 1996. John, tell me how you got the job working for ET, and how was, and what was it like working with Mary Hart? Well, it's another one of those um, ridiculous things that's <clears throat> that happened in my life, and and it was. Uh, I, I was in Europe and I was covering the Tour de France bike race as a composer and also as a as, a, as an announcer. And uh, there was a, um, a message that got to me through through the network that there was somebody from Paramount Television, which produced Entertainment Tonight, uh, trying to reach me. And uh, and I said, "Well, who is it?" And he said, "It's a guy named Frank Kelly." Hmm. And I said, uh, "I said, okay, well, I'll um, I'll call him when I get back." I was in the middle of nowhere. I said, I'll call him when I get back home. I came, I got back to the States in two or three days. And there was another message from him on my answering machine uh, then. Uh, this was 85, 1985. So I, I called him and he said, hey, would you be interested in, in just doing a, we're looking, we're looking for a newsier approach for our show Entertainment Tonight. Have you seen the show? And I, ha I had not seen the show. It had only been on for like you know, a year, year and a half. But I had no idea what he was talking about. And he said, uh, our, one of our hosts, Mary Hart, is, coming, is going to come to town, and uh, we'd like for you to do an audition with her. And I said, ah, I've already got a contract at, uh, at CBS Sports, um, but I'll be happy to, to come you know, and, and we can talk. And so he said, fine. And so I went and showed up for the, for the audition. I was terrible because I hadn't done news in six, seven years, and this is really what that was. It was sort of a newscast with, yeah. with teleprompter and stuff like that. But I did it, and I didn't hear anything from them for you know for the longest time. And and uh, the president of CBS Sports called me in and said, "Hey, I just want you to know, I know you have a you know, we have six eight months left on your contract, but we're not going to be doing the Tour de France or any of these other events that uh, that you've been known for. And so, if you have another opportunity, you might want to consider it." I'm thinking, 
first of all, it was really nice that he actually did this because most yeah. people just hire you and move on. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I became very interested in the entertainment tonight job at that point. Yeah. What were like the differences? I mean, you obviously you've worked in, in television news all these years, but now you're entering a program where it's more entertainment, no pun intended, based where you have, you're talking about music, movies, pop culture. What were some of the differences working at that kind of a job versus working at a news station where you're talking about more pol political issues, international and national news? What were some of the differences? It was like eating cake every day. Um, it was uh, the reason I took the job and they were amazing to me. Uh, Entertainment Tide, they promoted my career. They're, they're one, of the, one of the big reasons why I even had the live at Red Rock show. Mm -hmm. um, but they, uh, uh, it was, I only had to work four hours. I was in there. Wow. I, yeah, I was in there like at nine o'clock. I was out by one. Hmm. Um, and then I was able to, to record music for the rest of the, of, of, the, of the day. But you have to understand that, I mean, I was doing prior to that, um, I mean, I was interviewing everybody from Jimmy Carter, Gerald Ford, to Jimmy Connors and uh, Franz Klammer, and you know all the all the biggest biggest athletes you can possibly imagine, and yeah. and and doing two two hour live uh, sportscast without a script, you know. So I, they, I had been, um, I had definitely been forged by <laughs> by, <laughs> by by challenge, and by the time I got to Entertainment Tonight, I was I was young, I was thirty four, yeah. but I'd already had a career. Um, and it was, it was easy. It was just, it was easy and it was, uh, it was, it was fun and it was a lot of attention. I mean, when you're on sports, you're on, not on camera all that long. And here I was on camera every night and 23 million people were watching me do that. And so it was, um, it, it was a little daunting, you know, it was a little, a little scary, but they, they were terrific. And, and it was, re that was probably the largest platform for, um, for advancing my music career. You had such a remarkable run at Entertainment Tonight. Do you recall some of your most memorable interviews? Yeah, I mean, my favorite interviews at ET. I mean, I didn't, I didn't, um, I wasn't one of the correspondents, one of the one of the reporters, and, and I had had that conversation with them when I took the job, which was, uh, you yeah, know, I really want to have the rest of my day free, uh, and I took a big pay cut when I went to Entertainment Tonight initially, um, because I was just sort of an unknown. I only had a thirteen week contract. But, but I felt like the, the, I felt like the risk was, was worth it because, uh, cause I might, I might be able to, um, to work on my, uh, on, on my music career at the, you know, at, at, at the same time. And so, um, it was, uh, it, it was, it was really a, a, really a good fit for me. Um, and when they said, when I said, I would like to do the, do the, the music interview. So, I would say probably, um, you know, Phil Collins, uh, Eric, Eric Clapton, Billy Joel, uh, um, John Williams, people like that, Henry Mancini. Those are some of my favorite, favorite interviews because they were, uh, Sting was probably one of my, I interviewed Sting like two or three times because he was, he just really had it figured out. I mean, they, they, they when he was with the police, I mean, they sent me um, out to cover their, uh, their tours. I went out for about three or four days and, and, and the, the tips that I got from Sting, just watching him do soundtrack, uh, sound check, it, it's the same process that I use today when I'm, when, when I'm, when I'm touring everything that I learned just by watching that for three days. It was actually, it was actually when the, um, it was the dream of the blue turtles, um, tour and he was with uh, Branford Marsalis was playing mm -hmm. saxophone with him. So he wasn't with police actually the police. And you uh, met your wife, Connie Selica, uh, through that gig. And I know that both of you have two kids, Gib and Prima. Tell me how you met Connie. I met Connie, and this is actually two chapters long in the, in the Relentless book because it's just insanity. Uh, I was uh, assigned to, to go do an event in, in, in Palm Springs. Uh, at the same time that Connie, who I knew her, I, I knew her from Greatest American Hero and also Hotel, but I'd never met her. And so um, I uh, was in a gym in the, in the hotel and I ran into her, but she was the only other person in the, in the, in the gym. And I was instantly smitten and also sort of, uh, you know, flat footed. And I, 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 like the last minute as I was walking, we talked and when we were in there for a little bit, the last minute I asked her out 
this is pretty a hilarious part of the book. And, um, and then when it came time for me to see her later in the week, Friday, um, uh, I did, I failed the show. I chickened out. Mm. And so the, the next chapter is the, uh, the path that I took, the relentless, gritty, persistent path that I took to, uh, to try and win her back. And so um, that was 29 years ago and it worked wow. out. Wow. Yeah. And you got to work with pianist and composer Yanni. You got to go on tour with him. And another big highlight of your career was getting to do a television special for the public broadcasting system, PBS, at the Red Rocks Amphitheater. How did that opportunity come about, John? Um, I realized that that uh, that nobody was going to sign me to a record deal, right? Uh, they just I kept you know I kept applying and 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 people just were not interested. I think it was just because it was I was such a television I was just known for television and not really for music. And so when I saw the three tenors and oh, and Yanni too at the Acropolis and and also um, uh, the Moody Blues at Red Rocks, I thought, well, this is. Um, I need to do something this big, you know, if nobody's going to, going to pay attention to, to the fact that I really, I really consider myself a, you know, a, a professional musician. And so we, my, my wife and I took a, we had saved up some television money and we took a second mortgage on our house and we put together a live at Red Rocks and we didn't have a promise from, from PBS to do anything with it. Mm -hmm. uh, but there was a wonderful woman from uh, Maryland public television, Linda Taggart, who, um, who took a chance on it on a Sunday night and, uh, and it aired it once and it sort of blew up for PBS. And then all the stations started running it. And we went from selling 50 records a, a week to like 50,000, which was crazy. And, uh, and that was what, the, what allowed me to leave television and, 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 uh, and start my own record company and sort of, and we never did sign up with a record company. We mm. just, we had, we had a record company buy our record company, which was Polygram. Yeah. Um, but uh, it, it's, it is that whole thing of investing in yourself, you know? Yeah. And, uh, but it was, I don't, I don't recommend the risk at all. Talk me through the process of writing songs. In your book, you talk about the process of writing the music for Round Ball Rock, which was the theme of NBA on NBC from 1990 to 19, to, from 1990 to 2002. Can we hear it still today, to this day, as a lead into other sporting events? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, ABC, when, when ABC got the rights to, to the NBA, uh, they decided to do their, their, their own song uh, when they got the rights away from, from NBC. Uh, but the song uh, had a huge following on YouTube, you know, once YouTube became more popular. And so what happened was uh, a bunch of people have over the years learned how to play it. And so whether it's on, a, you can see it on ukulele, you can see it on uh, on Casio keyboard, people are playing it with a, you know, with the nose flute and it's just, it's, it's, it's sort of crazy. Right. Um, mm -hmm. it took on a life of its own that way. And then recently, uh, um, Fox, Fox sports put it on their, um, on their, was it basketball? I can't even remember on their basketball coverage. Yeah. Um, and cause we haven't, we haven't seen that in a while because of the quarantine, but, mm -hmm. uh, but it, it does continue to live on sports, but just on, it's on, um, uh, uh, college sports now. Well, we're going to take another brief pause. We're going to play a selection from your live concert at Red Rocks that you did on PBS. This is The Key of Love from John Tesh here on The Piano Men. And we're back on The Piano Men with Stanley Carr talking with iconic broadcaster, pianist, composer, and author of his new book, Relentless. We're here with John Tesh and want to talk to you about your radio show. You've got the John Tesh Radio Show, also known as Intelligence for Your Life. It's on about 350 stations across North America on, on, on several different adult, contemporary, and classic hit stations. Tell me about how you started the show. What's the format like? Um, the, well, I mean, it's, the show is basically little, you know, little tips that um, you can use to hack your life forward, if you will. And then, and then we, and we send it out uh, with, you know, with nine, nine different appearances from me and from me and Gib and Connie uh, per hour. And then, um, and then we uh, uh, allow the stations, of course, to, to use their, their own music, but it's, it's a very, it's an expensive show to produce and always was, even when we only had six stations where, you know, we have a, you know, about, you know, about half a dozen researchers who are, who are all finding all this information. I mean, you know, most radio shows are like two people, right? They're, they're, yeah. they're doing it. But, 
it's, uh, it, it caught on pretty quickly only because there's so much information and, you know, available now that people were always looking for a curator. And so that's really what we, we, we just became curation for, for in, encouraging personal development info. Well, with that said, John, do you have any intelligent tips you can give the listeners about surviving the COVID-19 crisis? I mean, you know, uh, you know, my thing is, uh, I, I survived a terminal cancer diagnosis. So for me, a, a virus is not the, is not, the, it's not the number one thing that I'd ever be afraid of, but it's, it's also, you know, it's, it's smart to, to understand that there are people that are, that are infected and that we have to be, we have to be careful with that. And we have to respect the fact that people are obviously people are dying. Um, but you also have to understand, and I have through the years of uh, research and, you know, and, and personal experience, that um, if you are consumed by fear, you can actually make yourself really, really sick. And so we talk a lot about that on the, on, on the air about, about how to renew your mind, um, Romans 12, 2 in the Bible, and, and how not to speak death over yourself, uh, Proverbs eighteen twenty one, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And so uh, our show is not a religious show, um, mm-hmm. but, but um, when, when you're healed uh, using, uh, using certain sp- scriptures, which is what happened to me, uh, then you, do, you, you have an opportunity, you have authority to actually mention that on the air. And so we, so we do, we talk about the, how dangerous fear can be. And those are, those are probably the most powerful tips that we give. Well, given the pandemic, I know it's hard for people to go to bookstores now. Where can people find your new memoir, Relentless? Yeah, I mean, Amazon is, a, is always a great place. I mean, you should probably buy it with toilet paper so it gets to you faster. <laughs> um, but, but also, uh, uh, you can go to, we have a website where I where I actually sign books. It's called johnteshrelentless.com. There you go. Where can people find more about you, like your music, your radio show? Do you have a social media page? It's um, it, the best place is just uh, facebook.com slash John Tesh. Well, I'm glad you're doing better. And I just want to thank you for coming on. It means a lot to me and my listeners. And you're more than welcome to come on anytime. I love it. I love it. Thanks, Stanley. I appreciate it. Good luck to you. All right. Well, thank you, John. Make sure to buy his new book, Relentless, Unleashing a Life of Purpose, Grit, and Faith. You can buy it on Amazon or just buy it on John's website. We're going to close with Bastille Day. This is another original by John Tesh. Thank you for listening to The Piano Men with Stanley Carr. You can find us on Facebook by going to facebook.com slash The Piano Men Radio Show. I'll see you next week.